So good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on suckler breeding and management. Dennis Howard is my name. I'll be facilitating the webinar this evening, and I'm delighted to be joined by Rose Goulding, who's the Beef Programme Manager with NCBC, the National Cattle Breeding Centre, and well-known Galway vet Conor Geraghty, uh, who's also the current president of Veterinary Ireland. So I suppose as by way of introduction, there is a motto that we often use in Munster Bovine, that genetics creates the potential, management realises it, and disease destroys it. And I suppose for me, one of the two big areas that you can improve inside, inside the farm gate are genetics and grass. Um, but you can go to a lot of effort improving your genetics, improving your management, and a lot of it can be eroded if there is a disease outbreak like scour or pneumonia, or if there's an underlying disease like IBR or lepto or liver fluke or something like that. So with that in mind, um, we're going to start off tonight with Conor Garrity, and Conor Garrity is going to go through some of the herd health issues that are important now during the housing period in suckler herds, and then moving on into calving, so getting cows ready for a successful calving season, and then on to optimise calf health during the spring. And we'll follow on then with Rose Goulding, who's going to give us a run through the new beef catalogue, so looking at... Um, uh, looking at the bulls, especially some of the new bulls. And it's always enjoyable listening to Rose uh, to get her insights because um, she's the one that buys the bulls and monitors the bulls. So, and at the end then we'll have a panel discussion. So it's a great chance for you to ask questions to, to both Rose and Connor. So don't forget to submit your questions. There's a question and answer function there uh, on your screen. And finally then the webinar has been recorded. So it'll be there to, to view later for anyone that wants to do that. So, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'll welcome in Connor. And so Connor is going to go through in his presentation some of the, the herd health um, tasks, I suppose, now for, for the winter and for the housing period. So over to you, Connor. Thanks, Dennis. Can you hear me there again? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, just a quick run through, I suppose, from, from housing on just before calving. And, um, and that's a, a period of time that, you know, if you get it right, you can you can control a lot of the issues that you have in springtime. So uh, it's about prevention, it's, I suppose, it's better than cure. Um, let me see now if I can move this on. You know. Okay, so I suppose the plan is, we'll just talk about housing at the moment. Most cattle are in now, but um, maybe haven't done their, their, their housing treatments. Talk about parasite control, um, vaccines and actions you can take and hopefully see the benefit of that then after Christmas if your cow if the spring pain hurt. Um, I suppose just to recap what the plan is, you want to have your cows born alive, stay alive, uh, be healthy and thriving and for the cows to go back and calf. Now we won't cover all of that, but we'll, we'll, we'll certainly get up as far as, as, as the cows being born. Um, so at housing, you know, it's an ideal time to look at body condition score of the cows. So in, in lots of cases, suckler cows will be quite heavily conditioned, especially this year, plenty of grass for the back end. Um, if you look at the nutrition and minerals and the parasite control and any vaccination programs that you have running or that you might want or that you might consider putting in place um, well in advance of calving. Um, so I suppose if you look at the, the, the thing not to do is to, to, to feed cows high quality silage ad lib all the way up to the first of or the middle of January, 1st of February, and then try and starve the cows to take condition off them in the last six weeks before calving. That's that's what you don't want to do because that's going to affect your um, colostrum quality and it will have a bearing on your calf health. So if if you can fix a lot of the body condition score issues now before, you know, before the middle of January and then maybe introduce a bit of better quality feed to the cows um, just before calving, you'll have a lot less problems. Um, so I think that's probably one of the one of the take home um, messages from this evening. So you want a cow between three and three point five body condition score, which is fit, not fat, and as I said, corrected early in the dry period, not in the last six weeks. Nutrition depends primarily on silage quality, and 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 that's a function of energy or DMD and protein, and then whatever minerals um, or deficiencies or antagonists might be there. Um, if you have a deficit in energy and protein in late pregnancy, you'll get uh, uh, quite an acute loss of body condition score. And you'll often hear farmers say the cow put an awful lot into the calf. But essentially what that's happening is the calf is going to grow 
And if he's if if that growth um, isn't isn't coming from the field, it's going to come off the back. Um, and that has an effect if there if this if it's all coming off the back to feed the calf, then there isn't enough energy and protein there uh, to form proper colostrum that you need to make sure your cows uh, don't get scour in the morning. <clears throat> In general, beef, uh, beef cow colostrum is quite good. You don't have the issues that you would have in dairy cows with high volume, um, except there's a couple of exceptions where there's very low levels of nutrition before calving. If cows are on straw or very low energy hay, and if you have uh, mastitis or blind quarters, basically, that you don't know about, and maybe don't cough onto the calf is sucking the blind quarter. Um, parasites are important for a number of reasons. Firstly, you don't want to be feeding parasites um, you want whatever you're feeding the cow to be good, to be a benefit to the cow. Um, it also has an issue with dirty cows. So if cows are very soft and are dirty, it will lead to more crypto, more scouring uh, in the following spring. And if things are bad enough, it can affect colostrum quality as well. Um, so we're primarily talking about suckler cows this evening. I suppose people might ask why your parasites becoming more of an issue. And I think that's a function of or grazing management. So um, parasites have a three-week life cycle, essentially, and our pasture management is based on a three-week grazing rotation. Um, we're also tending to graze down bare rather than coming in with a topper. And so essentially, we're, we're forcing animals to graze all the grass that's in the paddock, uh, which is good for grassland management and you grow more grass. But as a consequence, any parasites that are there are going to be consumed. Uh, and it's just something that we have to be cognizant of. Um, sixty percent of the parasite eggs will be at the bottom, uh, four centimeters of the sward. So if you're grazing tight or golf ball grazing, as as some refer to, you're certainly going to pick up all of those. Um, again, it's a three week life cycle for worms. Fluke is a bit different. Um, so essentially, your grazing management are going to come around about just when the worm eggs are hatching out again. So the the better your grassland management and the higher your stocking density, the more parasites you're going to see. As the year goes on, then you're going to see those parasites build up and pasture get more contaminated. And the main risk of disease is from July, August onwards till October until basically cattle are housed. So this time of the year is an important time of the year uh, to make sure your parasite control is correct. Um, we see people dosing in April, May and June when it's more important this time of the year. Um, the cattle are housed, so it's an ideal opportunity to take care of parasites that would have um, got in the last three months. Um, I suppose this slide is one of the Chagas profit monitors. The main difference between farms in the top third and the bottom third is output. So, uh, you know, if you're getting more bang for your buck, um, the fixed costs tend to be not that different and, and inputs tend to be not that different. Um, just on stomach worms, this is a, a, the inside of a stomach that uh, of an animal I postmortem a couple of years ago. Um, you, you can see this where you have an awful lot of uh, stomach worms in, in August, September time. And, you know, they can actually kill animals. So, but it's important to have a proper plan because certainly won't try um, if the lining of their stomach is, is, is damaged to that extent or even less than that. Um, a few years ago, I put this in the vet's corner in the farmer's journal and it was about calls for the previous week and they were nearly all parasite calls. So we're seeing loads and loads of calls to sick animals that turn out to be parasites. So they are certainly becoming more of an issue. Um, lungworm is probably over in most cases it's cattle are housed but I suppose um, if you're if you're thinking about it it takes two weeks for, um, for the lungs to heal after after you dose them um, if, they, if they have lungworm and ideally if you can do that two to three weeks before they go to the shed uh, you have less chance of pneumonia so this is more for autumn born calves um, but certainly it's, it's far better for what we call a pre-housing dose that you would give a product with some with some persistence, um, so that that lung healing takes place place outside. And persistence, then, so you take your white doses or your yellow doses. They don't have much persistence. 24, 12 to twenty four hours. Um, your typical ivermectin two to three weeks, and as you go on into get outside deck, and you get longer out. So, uh, liver fluke, um, you know, we would see that in certain parts of the country. Um, you see scour ill thrift, bottle jobs are fairly bad. Um, you'd see reduced um, food conversion efficiency and daily live weight gain and a longer time to finishing. So I think Tagus did some 
research in Grange there maybe four years ago uh, where the categories delivers and there was a, a 34 kilo um, carcass differential on animals that had a damaged liver versus those that didn't um, you know so you're, you're talking about 120 euros ahead on that um, of a benefit of, of control and fluke and the same applies to cows there's no advantage in having cows um, that have um, fluke burdens you can see from the red dots in the map you know, there's a lot of country that isn't affected, but typically a lot of the areas of the country where suckler cows are prevalent, um, there are um, fluke problems. And I suppose what we see in, in, in our particular part of the country wouldn't be one of the real red spots, but we have farms that would have fee individual fields within the farms of where, where there is fluke. And, um, you know, you need to sort of use that knowledge to, 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 to predict if, if fluke is going to be an issue or not, you know. Um, so the life cycle of fluke is slightly different than, than the rest of the, uh, the ordinary worms in that um, it's much longer. So when say eggs that hatch out in spring, they'll only hatch when the, when the daytime temperature hits about 14, 15 degrees. And then they will find a snail to mature in, um, which uh, they spend most of the summer in the snail and hatch out of the snails in August, September, depending on when the hatch in springtime was. So again, it's an autumn time disease. That's when they pick up the, the flukes. So uh, typically September, October. Um, and if they're housed in November, then, you know, it's basically a treatment at Christmas, typically in this part of the world um, for fluke. Again, once they're hatched and, and come into the animal, they're early immature flukes. Um, once they hit six weeks in the, in the animal, they're immature flukes. And once they hit 12 to 13 weeks in the animal, adult fluke. So it's important if you're dosing six weeks after housing, for example, that you're using a product that hits immature fluke, because if you use one that hits only adult fluke, you're actually going to miss all the fluke. So this is something you should discuss with your own vet to make sure that you're using something that actually works. Um, Roman fluke slightly different. Um, generally, it requires water receding. So either a pond that um, has dried up during the summer or where you get flash flooding from um, thunderstorms in, in, in July and August. Um, you typically tend to see this at outright less than liver fluke. You can get a quite a lot of pos positives back on dung samples for it, but unless you get the positive plus an animal scouring, I wouldn't bother um, treating for it. Um, it's of no consequence only in the larval stage. Um, one of the main uh, issues with sulfur cows uh, in sheds is the amount of condition they lose um, due to lice and mange. And I think um, it's important. I think people are very frustrated with it sometimes and having to retreat them. Um, I suppose two key points I'd like to make about these is one is there's biting lice and sucking lice. Um, biting lice doesn't uh, respond to ivermectin, so you have to treat it with uh, a different product. And the key is to, to treat them before they get too bad because then there's eggs everywhere that keep hatching out. So ideally treat them at housing. And if you if you generally have a lot of lice, treat them again two weeks later, and that um, should help a lot. Um, mange, I suppose, is something just to be wary of. Mange is slightly different and requires different treatment. So if you see animals tearing at themselves and actually sometimes in this very bad case in drawn blood, um, just be conscious that it's not nice and that it does require different treatment than if you should to your vet and he or she will direct you the best way to do it. So the question is, I suppose, and a lot of people ask me this this time, is how do I know if my cattle need dosing? And I suppose, first of all, you'll have the history of the farm from, you know, whether there's fluke there or not. You'll have the various clinical signs or animals thriving or the soft or et cetera. The factory reports you get back if you're killing animals are very useful for fluke. Um, you can take fecal samples for worms, but just be conscious of, the life cycle of fluke that I showed you a while ago, you'll have no positive fluke eggs from this year's fluke harvest, we would say, until January. So to getting a negative fluke sample in November isn't any use to you, really. Um, you can do um, blood tests that mimic the bull tank samples that dairy farmers would use for the presence of fluke as well on three or four animals if you weren't sure. Um, I suppose this year we have an extended grazing season. So... That graph I showed earlier where the buildup of worms occur has been exaggerated because animals have been out grazing for so much longer. 
And we were seeing huge worm counts, especially in sheep, but also in calves. And um, I think it's something to be wary of that, you know, it's just a little bit different. If you've got an extra round of grazing at the end of the grazing season than normal, especially in your weanlings, that you might see more of that, um, more cases of worms, especially. Just to talk about vaccinations then, because I think it's a, probably an area that people kind of are either all in favour of or maybe don't know enough about. And I suppose this year, after everything with COVID, I think people are a lot more aware of what vaccines do and their value and, and their limitations as well. So there's two main uses uh, to vaccines. The first one is that they're useful to prevent an animal's getting a disease that they previously isn't circulating in the farm. So that would be biosecurity. So an example of that would be BVD, that if you're vaccinated for BVD, you haven't BVD on the farm and you don't want to bring it in. So you would use vaccine as, a, as an aid to that, perhaps. The second one is, which a lot of people would use, is vaccines to prevent the, the spread of a disease within a, um, a herd. So biocontainment. So if you have, for example, uh, lepto in the herd that you would use vaccine or IBR, that you would use vaccine to stop it spreading from animal to animal and keep the spread uh, as minimal as possible. And then thirdly, you would use vaccines to prevent diseases that are not treatable. So your clostridial diseases like your black leg, that if, if the animal get it, they're more than likely going to die, then you would use vaccine to, to prevent that. And COVID vaccine is kind of a little bit of that plus a biosecurity vaccine. So you're trying to minimize getting it, but also if you get it, you're hoping that it'll minimize the signs. Um, so I don't know how many, there's about 132 people on here this evening and if a question went up, should I vaccinate? So I can't answer that question for all 132 people because that wouldn't be correct. It is very farm, farm specific. The first thing you'd need to know is what diseases are present on your farm what the buying policy is on the farm. And I suppose if you didn't know what diseases are present, is to establish what we call a herd status. So find out what diseases are there. And then when you have found out that, you have to look at the risk. So the risk is X, and will there be a cost benefit for treating or controlling that? And if you decide there is, then you commence the program. And then the final one is a very important one. You have to stick to the program. So just a bit about immunity. So immunity is a very broad thing. Um, we have immunity in ourselves and it's, it's, it's made up of a number of different factors. And in actual fact, if you look at that graph there, it's the bottom right-hand corner, the active immunization um, of a subset of artificial immunity. That's vaccination. So it's a very small part of immunity, but it can be a big help in certain situations. But you also have, you know, the animal's own innate immunity, nutrition, hygiene, all the rest that goes with it. So establishing a herd or, or a status for a disease, um, you might have had a history of a breakout of disease. You might see suboptimal performance. You might test um, a group of animals that were affected. You might have some um, post-mortem information of, from an animal that died. If you had none of the above, the most useful thing to do is to, is to take blood from what we call a young stock screen. So um, animals that were reared on your farm that are between nine and 12 months old are ideal because they, um, they're over nine months, so the colostrum won't interfere with the test. And if they show up positive, it means that they came in contact with that disease in the last 12 months on your farm. So then you know it's actually circulating on your farm. So it's much better to do yearling heifers than old cows to get an accurate picture of what's going on. Um, at that stage, then, you look at risk versus the like, so the severity, basically the risk matrix is the likelihood of getting a disease versus the severity of what would happen if it came in. Uh, so if you're very likely to get a disease and it's likely to have a very severe impact, then you're in the red, you're in the top left-hand corner, and it's going to be probably very advisable that you vaccinate. Now, if, if you have a very low likelihood of getting the disease and you would say you have a closed heart and you're not going to buy in anything, and even if you get it, it's not going to be too severe. Then you're in the bottom right-hand corner, which is green. You're, you know, there's probably a questionable benefit of, um, of using a the vaccine there, because you, you might get the reward. So an example of the top of the red one is that, you know, if you're after digging a tank or doing some construction and there's a history of black leg on the farm, and you know that it's a very high risk that you're going to have outbreaks of black leg the year after, 
and it's the severity is you're going to find dead animals, you know, uh, in the field, then that's that's a big risk. So using a vaccine is very advisable there. Whereas down at the very bottom corner, I would say if you had sheep um, and you have very little foot rot and you don't buy in at it mightn't be that advisable to vaccinate for foot rot. So that would be sort of the way you'd work it out um, in a kind of a logical manner. I have a few examples here just to point out to people how, you know, how we look at this. So um, these are real life examples, obviously, from back over the last few years. I'm not going to mention any names, obviously. So we have a farm with 20 cows, buys two wing calf heifers every year, uh, buys a bull every five years. His empty rate is 10 to 15 percent and his calving spread is from January to June. So we know that he had a fertility issue and that's why he came to us. Um, we looked at the cows. See, was around the wrong. We looked at the bull. We looked at the mineral profile. Bull was okay. Minerals, he had a bit of a deficiency in copper and iodine and in the young stock screen. So in the urine heifers, he had a lot of antibodies to lepto. So we know that there's a lepto, that lepto was circulating in that herd in the year that we were talking about. And I suppose what we're looking at is the cost of replacements plus the lost kilos from the late carvers and the vaccine cost of 50 euros per annum. So it was absolutely a no-brainer um, to use vaccine there because for your 50 euros, you were going to pull back cabin spread and you were going to pull back on having to keep replacing um, heifers. Um, so that's some, the decision was made scientifically that vaccine was the, was the way to go there. Um, another example from 2017, um, with 60, 60 cow uh, super herd spring and autumn cabin, boys replacement heifers, but bulls them on farm. Uh, no BVD case from all the years from 2013 to 2017, never vaccinated. Um, sold a heifer, win a heifer in October 2017, and she was returned in calf in January 2018. So he had sold her in March and produced her in calf, and she came back in January, and she calved at the end of January. Uh, I sectioned her. Uh, she was only about 15 months. Now, she, the calf wasn't registered until the cow was 18 months. Um, and when it was registered, it turned out he was PI. So he had the calf had been knocking around the sheds from January to April. Um, and the autumn, that autumn then, the autumn born calvers uh, out of 22 had 19 PIs born uh, that had to be sent to the NACRA. So um, essentially what you had there was, um, you know, an unfortunate event that happened, but it just showed you like what can happen and the man was at a serious loss. So um, something that could absolutely turn your ear upside down or maybe a few years, um, you know, so would you, would you have advised him to vaccinate? Probably not, but he would, should certainly have pegged any incoming animals immediately. Um, to make sure that, um, that that there wasn't BVD present. Um, but he's his, his using vaccine since because of the issue and the risk. But to be honest with you, I suppose there's a case there where you would either use vaccine or use biosecurity measures um, rather than, than vaccinating for everything. And finally, I suppose just the typical one is, is calf score. It's a 25 cow spring calf and herd calf in February to April. And the last 15 calves every year get scour. Um, they're all treated. Um, generally, two of the 15 would need um, IV drips and, you know, an odd one would uh, would die as well. So uh, on testing, we get rotavirus and crypto. So this is not a simple case of just vaccinating for rotavirus. You know, you have to manage the crypto end of it um, as well. So it's important when you're putting in a vaccine, a vaccine program that you know what you're vaccinating for and you know where the limitations are and you know what else is at play. Um, so they're very useful where they're needed, but they're not a silver bullet, I suppose is the key point, and, but they make a real difference in some farms. And it's very important to do it, do it scientifically and get advice from your vet. Um, monitoring is also important to make sure that, you know, what, you're, what you think you're doing or achieving is actually happening. Um, picture on the right there is me. Every Monday morning, I go down to a, a local boar stud and I take some bloods to uh, monitor whether there's any diseases in it. It's a disease-free unit. Um, but just to talk about closed, people talk about closed hearts. Um, come in, come on to the place, shower, change into their clothes, 
put on an oversuit, there where it is, go in, take my bloods, come out, shower back into my own clothes and out again. That's biosecurity on the closed herds. I don't think, in fairness, most beef herds um, would have come anywhere near that. Um, I was chatting to someone in the department there a few months ago and they told me that only 6% of herds in Ireland are truly closed herds. So um, it's very important that um, you realise that, you know, people think I have a closed herd because they don't buy much. A closed herd is, is something completely different. So um, it's something that we in the in, in the suckler farmer industry maybe don't understand as much as in the more intensive industries. When it comes to parasite control, then just, I suppose, understanding pasture management is very important and getting advice that's, that's applicable to your farm and having the data from your dog samples or your factory reports. And it's like, I always say, it's like a three-legged stool. And, you know, if you haven't got one of the legs on a three-legged stool, you know, you're going to end up on the floor. Um, the current issue is that with parasite control, it certainly there's more parasites with the milder weather, more intensive grazing patterns. Um, certainly global warming probably has a bit to do with it. Long grazing season like we had this year. We are seeing antelmintic treatment failure, which is slightly different than antelmintic resistance. So sometimes it's resistance and sometimes it's treatment failure. So um, using products properly, making sure the dose and guns and the, and the the injectors are calibrated and that you're getting the right dose for the right weight can be as much a cause of treatment failure as resistance, but we certainly are seeing both in instances happening. Um, so in summary, I suppose, and I'll do a little bit about pre cab and if I have time, um, Dennis, you can jump in there if I'm running out of time or whatever, um, is housing is an opportunity to get things right pre calving So you want to get your body condition score right, you want to get your parasite control right, your vaccine plans right, and get everything lined up for when um, things start happening, usually around the 1st of February. Just I suppose, as we nearer calving, then you have to turn your right to calving facilities. And the number you have, and make sure they're clean and disinfected is very important, especially if you have any sort of a problem last year, crypto or rotavirus, or coccidiosis, it's important those sheds are cleaned and disinfected. Um, you need plenty of straw, I, regardless of what price it is, you need it if you're going to calve cows. And ideally, especially for health and safety for yourself, um, calving gates are very important as well, especially for sulfur cows. Um, get your equipment and time, make sure you have gloves and gel and ropes and the jack is working and all the rest of it. Um, stomach tube, you know, spare colostrum, and you know, a lot of people are using sensors and cameras. We make sure the camera is working and check it out, um, etc. This, I suppose, is one of the key things um, about calving. So there's three stages to calving, and the first stage usually lasts two to eight hours, and it's when the cervix dilates and the fetus comes into position, and um, at the end of it, the water bag comes out. So it's long before the water bag comes out. This is stage one. Stage two is from when the water bag comes out until the calf comes out. And stage three then is, is cow cleaning, passing the placenta. The key thing is, is if you're going to move cows out to a calving area, you either do it before stage one starts or you wait till the water bag comes out. So if you move a cow or especially a heifer in stage one, you can delay stage two by up to 10 to 14 hours. Um, because that bit of stress or, or, or annoyance will stop her calving. So you can take a heifer that's, you know, thinking tail out, start in the pen, be able to take her out and put her into the calving pen. You can actually cause a problem there because she won't get down to calf. So if you haven't spotted her before she's doing that, leave her where she is until the water bag is passed and then take her out. I, I think that's a very important part of um, calving cows. I think that's something we see is, a lot of cows that are quite tight behind because they've been moved at the wrong time. Calving gates uh, are, are very important that they're secure and safe, but you know, cows react completely differently, especially if you have help or you know, um, maybe someone going back from college giving you a hand, or if you call the vet or whatever. Um, cows react very differently, and we, you know, unfortunately, we hear every year farmers getting caught with 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 cows. Um, but it's all, they're also extremely handy to get a calf sucking or to milk some colostrum. Uh, and I think they're a must in every farm. <clears throat> um, bad ideas are, well, don't put them in two types of the corner and don't have the right side face out. So if you are putting them in, make sure that um, they can be used to do a C-section if they're needed and that you can get the cow in them easily. Um, 
you know, this is a perfect example of, of a good gate. It's left side facing out. You can actually use both sides. Um, and the little V uh, edge on it here, you can put a calf sucking safely without getting killed. So I think, you know, these, these are great um, ideas. Um, then a little bit about calving, you know, it's about patience and hygiene and making the right decision. And then, you know, your techniques. So most people know how to do it technique-wise, but patient's hygiene and making the right decision are key. Um, I hope down are the days where we're pulling calves with tractors. I certainly remember it as a, as a, as a young lad, but um, certainly it's cows need time and patience uh, to calf. So people, some people intervene too, too early on. I think that's probably a common enough thing. Um, you have to give the cow a chance. And as long as she's making progress, I would leave her alone. Um, I'd intervene if the water bag is out an hour and there's no progress for um, for a half an hour. So an hour and a half after the water bag comes out, no progress, bring your hand um, and see what's going on. If stage one lasts more than six hours, so if a cow is circling around the pen with no water bag for more than six hours, certainly she needs to be examined. Uh, and then the key thing at this stage is Bearing in mind that you may have to do a cesarean in, in an hour's time is to make sure and clean down the cow's perineum and insert a glove, uh, a glove lubricated hand. So you don't want to bring in fecal material into the uterus, if you think about it, and an hour later have to do a cesarean where some of that fluid is going to leak around the abdomen. So um, it's very important. Hygiene at that stage is very important. So... Dystochia or hard calvings, the causes are basically the cow and the calf being disproportionate, which is usually a genetical issue, and Rose wants to talk about that. So bull selection is very important. The pelvic area of the cow is very important, and many farmers have noticed, and the body condition score of the cow. Um, also, you can have abnormal presentations. In older cows or cows of milk fever, you can have uterine inertia, where the cow is never to push up the calf. You can have a uterine torsion. And then you can have what we call monsters, so deformed calves that are maybe, um, or two calves together or whatever, two calves, um, Siamese twins or things like that. The big decision that has to be made at this stage is the calf too big to be pulled. And, um, you know, various people have various ways of doing this, but, uh, you know, if the head and legs are in the passage and there's room over the head, people will say that's a sign that, he's, that he can be pulled. It's not something I'd use. I don't think it's reliable enough. I think... If you have the calf's head and leg in the passage, you have the ropes on, and if you can move the calf's um, leg an inch or two with just your hand uh, with, on the end of the rope, then, you know, it's quite likely. That what that means is that you're able to move his shoulder within that pelvis. Um, and if you can move his shoulder with your hand in the pelvis, it's more than likely you'll be able to jack the, the, the back end out of, out of the pelvis. If you have to jack the shoulder into the pelvis, then it's highly unlikely you're going to be able to jack the back end, which is wider, out of the pelvis. So that's, you know, uh, it's a useful tool. And it's certainly one I've never got caught since I started using that uh, metric um, to calve cows. So making the decision, you're either going to get a live calf, you're going to end up in a disaster, or you're only going to end up breaking legs. So um, this is the crunch time for making the, the right decision. Um, when it comes to technique, then you, what you want to do really is work with a cow. Um, and between the contractions, you want to take the pressure off because the calf needs to breathe. And if the calf is in full pull with his two legs out that way, he can't spread his ribs to breathe. So basically what you're doing is you're suffocating. So if you take the pressure off, he's able to take a breath and then, either, and then you can help the cow again. I think that, that's very important. And the other thing is, if any of you are ever watching cow calving on the camera, you know, it's going to take 15, 20 minutes for a cow to calve on the camera. There is no need for a cow to be jacked out in 30 seconds, or a calf to be jacked out in 30 seconds. Um, so basically all you're doing is aiding the cow. Um, rope application, you know, make sure they're even, um, knots on the inside, uh, above the fetlocks. Um, be very careful uh, when you're adjusting the rope and as I said, allow the calf to breathe. So um, this is pictures of a pelvis. And it's, it's slightly higher than it's wide in most cows, okay? So the widest part of the pelvis is um, at an angle. Now, if you look at this, I don't think it's a moose, but if he wants to put his head in that door, he has to turn his head sideways. Um, 
So basically, if you can rotate the calf slightly sideways um, once the shoulders are out, um, you will see this the, at, the, at, at, at uh, half six and at half 12, they're, the, they're the, the, the hip bones that are going to get caught. That's the widest part of the pelvis. So um, if you look at um, this calf here, he's being pulled square now. He's too big a knife. But uh, if you look at this calf here, the calf I was pulling, you can see the way he's turned slightly sideways. Um, and the handiest way to do that is just to rotate the jack um, like that on the cow once the shoulders are out. That can make a real difference um, in, in, in a fairly big calf. Resuscitating the calf then is something that's very important. So if you, if you can imagine it, you, you know, a calf comes out, he needs to be res resuscitated. His lungs basically need to, 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 to get rid of the, um, the acid by bringing in oxygen, getting rid of the carbon dioxide. If he's lying on his side, only one lung, lung is working. So you get him to sit like a dog, like in the picture there, and uh, then both his lungs are working. Clear his airway. Cold water is scientifically uh, known to reduce the um, acidosis. So cold water on the head or in the ear canals and manually breathing. So breathing for the calf on his ribs to actually shift the carbon dioxide. If you are suspending a calf by the hind legs, um, you only want to do it for 30 seconds. And the easiest way to do it without breaking your back is to put the ropes on the back legs of the calf, um, hold the jack up and just jack the calf up to full length and um, but just for 30 seconds. After that, you're putting pressure on the lungs. So this is, you know, the way you'd hopefully um, this guy is head down and as he breathes off the carbon dioxide, his head will come up. Uh, post calf and then the usual things, um, hemorrhage, bleeding, downer cows, um, retained um, placenta, prolapse uterus, or calf with injuries. And I think, you know, we all have come across those, but um, we won't go into them in too much detail at this stage. Um, so I suppose um, what we want to do now is just to recap. Uh, calving facilities are key. Make sure you have, that you're ready for calving. Um, and the overall picture is basically prevention is better than cure, as we know. But animals are going to get sick. So what you want once an animal gets sick is to have an, an effective cure and then use the knowledge that you've got from that outbreak of disease to um, and, and the data you've got and the experience to try and prevent it happening again. You know what I mean? So you can't prevent everything from happening. But once something does happen, you know, you can take steps to try and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and I think that's maybe... If you think back to last year, if you had scour, now is the time to start planning ahead. You know, if you've had a lot of calving difficulty, now is the time to, to, to take action. If you had a lot of crypto, you know, now is the time to make sure you get your codes clipped up and you get the dose and right so they're not too dirty, etc. Um, calf mortality, we know that on average, you know, what's, what's declared with 5%, you know, under seven days and 6 to 7% over, over or under 28 days. Most farms, as you can see in the graph on the left, have no mortality, but there's a small number of farms that have a lot of mortality. And, you know, sometimes we get used to it. We call it farm blindness. So, you know, if you're used to losing two or three calves, you think, well, that's normal. But, you know, it probably isn't. Um, and, it, and it can be prevented in most cases. Um, just, I suppose, farmers think, you know, sometimes when, when a calf is out on the ground and he's alive, that the game is over and, you know, job is done. But really, you're only at half time. Um, getting the colostrum into the calf is key. Um, and uh, as we know, earlier the better. So it's only absorbed for the first 24 hours. So the earlier the better. Um, I suppose the big issues with colostrum is calves not getting it or not getting it on time or getting a lot of muck before they get to the colostrum. So how mm -hmm. hygiene, I think, is very important for calf score. The other thing to watch, and it happens a lot in such cows, uh, especially the wilder ones, is the kind of blind teats and no one ever notices. Um, so it's something to get in the habit of they're in the gate. Uh, if you can safely get someone to lift the tail while you check that they have four spins and that there's mission all for them. Um, we did the colostrum quality. Just I suppose this is only my own data here. So this is um, the number of, of farms that are that are deficient of the ones that we tested uh, in islands, uh, copper and selenium. Um, especially selenium can affect... Um, uh, immunity and iodine can affect having weak and lazy calves. So 
you know, if you're suffering from any of those things, you can test four or five codes and just check it out. The other thing now, and we're, we're almost done, is that this graph here shows that the, the darker blue line on the left shows the benefit, the, the immunity that you get from colostrum, right? So it's a passive immunity. You give the calf a colostrum, um, he has immunity for, you know, a week or seven or eight days. But that begins to wane off. And then the calf has to, like us all, has to make her own way in life and make her own immunity, which is the thicker blue line on the right. But there's a high risk period, you know, between the colostrum going away and the calf developing his own immunity. And that's basically for the first, you know, in between the, let's say, the, the halfway through the first week and halfway through the third week. Um, and that's the high risk period. I think, if at all possible, the longer you can keep the cow and calf on a single pen after calving, uh, where it's dry and warm and straw, um, I think this is key for crypto. So in a lot of places we see bad crypto outbreaks in, in sucker cows. It's where, you know, we're tight for space and calves are going back onto, onto the cows are going back onto slats and calf, calves into creeps, um, you know, at less than a week old. And I think, the, you know, it, it can make a real difference. The longer you can keep them out on straw with, the, with their own cow on a nice warm bed, um, the less crypto that you're going to have. So um, I think that's the end of that. And we think we're leaving questions until the end. But um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyway. No, Dennis. Great stuff, Connor. Great stuff. Um, so I suppose if you stop sharing, and, and while Rose is sharing, I might ask you a question or two. Um, is it sure. In already. Um, so this guy here, a few heifers to calve, or a few heifers that calve before time with small calves. What could be the causes? Um, well, I suppose it depends how much before time. Uh, Rose is probably going to it now. The gestation period for the easy calving bulls is getting shorter and shorter. So... Um, <laughs> And um, that could be one reason. Cavin before time generally can be an iodine deficiency. It could be generally if it's if it's lepto or something like that, but calves tend to be dead. But you can you can get uh, pre time if you have uh, basically an iodine deficiency, which could be artificially created by feeding a lot of straw or feeding something that's very low iodine um, forage, like you know cattle hay or something like that. So. Um, what I would do in that case, if you're worried, is I maybe pull out three or four of them and just take bloods off them uh, and just see what might be the story there. But um, the other thing to, to be mindful of is some of the bulls that's going now really calf um, uh, uh, earlier than we'd, we'd expect. And the calves then are obviously smaller, you know. Very good. Very good. No, well, Rose, you were, you were sharing there and you, uh, you stopped. You might turn on your video as well, Rose and uh, okay. and Michael. Yeah. Hi. Good evening. Um, what I'll do this evening is I'll um, I'll go through a page of uh, the Monster Bovine catalog, and I'll just highlight all the information that's actually on every page in the catalog, and then I will go on and I will talk about bulls for specific purposes. Okay, so just this is the, the first page I've up here is of a, of a new Belgian blue bull. So just to talk about, and I'm just literally going to talk about the information on the catalogue now. The first bit of information we have on the catalogue, so we'll start at this top, so we've got the code and the name. Now, there's capital P, small p after this bull's name. And if you see uh, two capital P's or a capital P and a small p after a name, that indicates that the bull is actually pulled. And um, apart from Angus, all Angus are homozygous polled anyway, so we don't do it in the Angus. But for all other breeds, and we have a polled program now for all the, the beef breeds, uh, Limousine, Charlie, Belgian Blue, Hereford, and so on, you will find polled animals within each of the breeds. So this is just an example of a, of a blue bull that's polled. So that's what the capital P, small p is telling you. We're also telling you that again here in the stickers, where we're telling you he's heterozygous polled. So that means if you use this bull, 50% of the calves will be born um, without horns. That's assuming you're putting him in a fully hardened population. Okay, if he was homozygous polled, we would have two capital P's here. We would have homozygous polled here. And then that means that all of the calves will be born without horns 
whether you're going, you know, even if it's you're putting them totally across horn and cows, you'll still get all polled calves. Okay, so that's the first thing to watch out for in the catalogue is the, is the polled status. The other bit of information we have here now, just over the photograph that's very, very useful, is the myostatin status. And um, that tells us whether the animals are carrying the double muscle gene or not, because the myostatin gene is the same as the double muscle gene. So just to show a few examples here, this is a blue, and all blues are the same. They all carry two copies of the double muscle gene. Okay, so they're all going to be exactly the same. We just move on to the next bull. This is a limousine bull. So what's the story with this guy? So he's my statin status is plus plus. And when you see plus plus, that means that they're non-carriers for the myostatin. Okay, so if we flip, flick down along a couple of other examples we have here. So this is a Celere bull plus plus. He's a non-carrier of myostatin. The two simmentals here, same story, non-carriers. Charlie, same. Now here we have a Charlie bull and he's plus, and then he's carrying the Kyotuo 4X. So the Kyotuo 4X is, um, it's a different variant to the Belgian blue one. Uh, there are roughly about nine variants. So what this is telling us is this particular bull has one copy so he's plus on one side, which tells us it's, uh, he's not carrying it on this side, but on this side, he's one copy. And then if we go back to our limousine, our limousine is a non-carrier, but limousines carry another variant of myostatin that's called non-disruptive. So it doesn't cause any additional trouble with higher birth weights, um, difficulty with the females calving and so on. So they're not considered true carriers, but it's just a bit of extra information to let you know that they're carrying the, what's known as the profit gene. And all limousines are carrying that gene. Okay, so what's the use of looking at that information and what's the purpose? And I suppose there are a couple of reasons. Animals that are carrying the double muscle gene, you will get a little bit heavier birth weight with them. So if you have um, if you've twins born, and one of them happens to get the gene and the other one doesn't, so otherwise they're roughly the same genetics, the one that's carrying the myostatin gene will, will be higher, heavier birth weight. The other thing is you will get extra muscling with the myostatin gene, so that's a good thing. We normally want a bit more shape, we want a bit more muscling. So it's all, it will also help us mate our cows um, depending on what we're looking for. So for example, if we have a cow with quite a lot of shape, and when we have extra shape, we also have reduced calving ability. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking there of Connor's images with the dead calf and the calf with broken legs and the different options we don't want. So if you have a cow with extra shape, she's reduced calving ability. So then you go on her with a bull that's not carrying the gene. Okay. Because you've, you've, um, you've no chance then of getting a fully double muscled animal. Equally, if you have quite a plain animal, go ahead with your bulls that are carrying the double muscle gene. And if you want a lot of shape, go ahead with the ones that are carrying two copies because that will guarantee you more shape. Or go with your Charlie where um, you have one copy. So if you have cows and you know, you know the sires are, are carriers and they have a lot of shape themselves, you know, you can try and figure out, okay, she's probably a carrier. So I put a non-carrier on her. If you really want to go for extreme, go with a carrier, but accept the fact that you will have, you're more likely to have um, calving difficulty because the female's ability to calve is less and you're going for a more muscly calf. Okay, so moving down along our page now. So that's our double muscle um, piece of information there on the page. The other information we give on the page then, in addition to the index, and in addition to the pictures and in addition to the comments is we give, we put stickers in the catalog to just give you an idea of a bit of extra information on the bull. So this is telling you it's a new bull and it's a test sire. So what have you to go on here now? It's a brand new bull. So first of all, you can go on the index because with genomics now, the, um, the reliability of all the index is higher if the bull is genotyped and all our bulls in the catalog is genotyped. Okay, so you can look at the index. Also have a look at the, at the um, 
at the comments because you will get a bit of extra information on the comments. And also, especially if you're particularly interested in breeding, have a look at the pedigree. So this particular bull is a fist and son. His mother is a cave lens Fenian cow. So they're two bulls that, um, they're two monster bulls that you may have used already. So that'll give you a bit of an extra idea as to what this bull will do for you. Okay, so if we just look at the other bulls now and see what the stickers do we have. So this is another test sire and he's new. Powerful proper the same. Okay, here now we have a proven bull. So we know a lot more about this bull. We know that he's easy calving. And when we have a bull here marked easy calving and it's a charolais, what we're really saying is it's an easy calving charolais, which is not the same thing as an easy calving Angus. Okay, so, you know, it's relative to the breed. We're also saying that this bull, we have a wheeling sticker on him, which means that if you're in wheeling production, he is a bull good enough to give you good quality wheelings. And we also have the finishing sticker on him, which means that he's a good bull if you're in a finishing system. Now, you might ask me, what's the difference between a bull that's, you know, good wheelings usually end up being good finished cattle? That is true. But it's a matter of the, the level of maturity as well and how quickly animals develop shape. So um, animals that are good finishing bulls but not good wheeling bulls, they will not have enough shape at the wheeling stage. And you need shape at the wheeling stage if you're selling wheelings. Okay, so that's what the wheeling sticker will tell you. Now, if we go down further along, we have a Simmental here, the real exceptional bull here. So we're saying his average calving, so his average for a Simmental, you have good wheelings, you have good finished cattle, and he's also a good replacement sire. Now, you'll come across very, very few bulls in the catalogue with all those stickers because it's very hard to get all of those things in the one package. Okay, and this is a fully proven bull. And he's capable of doing all of those things. Now, here's an example of a bull. He's a Solaire bull, so he's extremely easy. we are saying he's a calving is as easy. He's good replacement. He's good on finishing. So we're not calling him a wheeling bull. Why? Because he won't have the shape you'll need at weaning stage. And you'll see that as well then when you look at the carcass confirmation, he's two star across breed. Okay, so when you go through the catalogue, if you just try and put, and you're trying to decide on what bull to use and what not to use and so on, try to use all the information that's there on the page because there is quite a lot of information on the page. Now, another point, when you're going through the index, it's really important that you're looking at the most up-to-date information available. So we get new genetic evaluations now every two months. So this catalogue was printed late September. And you can see this up at the side, it's quite small, but you can see that the source is ICBF September 21. So since then, we've had another evaluation in November. So this data is already a little bit out of date. Now, if a bull is fully, fully proven, like our friend uh, here, Karahin Arp, he's 96, 90, nearly 99% all the way down. There's no real need to check up his index to see if it's changed because it's not going to change a lot. OK, um, but you have a young bull here. His index could have changed um, since the catalogue was printed, OK, because more data could have come in on the pedigree and so on. Um, so that's why it's important to check uh, the date of the index. Now, that's why we put the QR codes here in our catalogues for the first time. And they're in all the pages of the catalogue, just to the left of the pedigree there. And uh, when you get a chance, um, take out the Munster catalogue, open up the camera on your phone. And if you hover your phone with the camera open over that QR code, you'll get a prompt to click on the ICBF um, website and you'll get, you'll get brought to that actual bulls page and you'll get all the updated data. OK, because bear in mind, you might be looking at this catalogue now next April when you want to put cows and calf. And you might be looking at information um, and you will be looking at information that's 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 out of date and there'll be a couple of evaluations in the meantime. OK, so use the QR codes to go in to get the up to date um, to get the up to date information. Now, let's have a look at the index. So when we're looking at these catalogue pages, 
um, if we just start at the start, the top three lines is just trying to give you an idea of where does a bull fit with the purpose you might want him for. And the first line is replacement. And that's really useful if you are thinking about using this bull and keeping replacements from him. So you've picked out your top cows. They're good breeders. They're good fertility. They're good milk. They're quiet. All of that good stuff you want in good cows. And you want to put replacement bulls on them. Then the replacement index is what you need to be, what you need to be looking at. If you're buying in your replacements, for example, or if you have cows that you want to just, you know, you want to put all terminal bulls across them and you'll be selling all the wheelings or finishing all the cattle, then it's the terminal index that you'll be interested in. The dairy beef index then is of interest to dairy farmers that might be looking at this bull and considering it, is it for them? Okay, so the dairy beef index is for dairy farmers, not suckler farmers. The first two are just for suckler farmers. The next bit of information then we get is on calving. And um, when we're talking about sucklers, we get two bits of information. We get we're, we're split, the, the calving on beef heifers and beef cows is split. OK, so if you want to use a bull on heifers, you absolutely need to look at the beef heifer calving difficulty. And what we've also put in there to help you a bit is the breed average. So this is a Charlie. Um, he's a young bull now, so we're just trying to figure out, you know, is he difficult calving or not? So what, what can this catalogue page tell us? The first thing we can see anyway is that he's a test sire. So that's, you know, we have to think, OK, I need to be careful where I use this bull. The second thing we have here is calving records. So we've no, there's no records off this bull. OK, so then that makes you a bit more information. He's 15 percent on beef heifers. Now, is that good or is it bad? So have a look at the breed average. So the breed average for Charlie is 10%. So it's telling us he's higher than the breed average. So, you know, that's useful information. And then when it's compared across all breeds, across all breeds, it's 8.2%. So we know now this bull is not for heifers, okay? And you won't find anywhere on his page where he's recommended for heifers. Now we just come down to the Solaire bull. Is this bull suitable for maiden heifers? We have a totally different story here now. He's recommended as, as easy calving, first of all, on stickers, is the first thing. If you read the comments, it tells you he's the perfect choice for maiden heifers. So this is a bull we're recommending for heifers. His figure is 5.1%. The all breeds is 8.2. So he's much, much easier calving than the average bull out there. And it's at 97% reliability. Okay, so that's really the bull you need to be going after for extreme easy calving and maiden heifers. We just look at all the information that's on that page that's giving you that information. Now, if you're using a bull for beef cows, then obviously have a look at the cow figure. And what's a great guide as well is, especially if you're using AI and you're used to so many bulls. So if you're used to using Fiston, for example, and just off the top of my head, he's about 5.7% difficulty on beef cows. And you had absolutely no trouble with him whatsoever. Okay. Then that's kind of your benchmark that I'm, I'm happy with that. You know, so if you're, um, if you're a uh, Charlie man and fist, you were using Fiston, then you can say, oh, there's Lapan. He's only 4.6. So he's easier than Fiston. So just find a benchmark for yourself with the bulls, you know, and that you have a good, you know, that you can find your own tolerance for calving ease, which is, that's a really good idea when you're trying to figure out whether a bull is easy calving or not, or if he's easy calving enough for you. And always look at the reliability. Okay, so come down a little bit. Gestation length. And um, just coming back to the, the question there about uh, cows calving early. Uh, gestation length is the length of the pregnancy. So it's basically the cooking time, you know, how much time a calf is inside in the cow. Now, we don't want exceptionally short gestation in sucklers, but what, what we want to avoid is very long gestation, you know, because we have had cases where, you know, cows are pregnant for 290, even up to over 300 days. And it's very difficult to get a calf every 365 days if they're in calf for 290 or 300 days. OK, so we want to avoid long gestation bulls. Now, what's a long gestation bull? What's a short? How can we figure out that looking at the index? The stars are a very, very handy way of figuring it out. 
And if you're a commercial farmer, you'll be more interested in the across breed stars because that compares all the breeds. So this bull I'm looking at here, Lapan, is four star across breed. So that tells me he's in the top 40% of the entire population for gestation length. So happy days, okay? Now look at his index. He's more or less at zero, okay? So that means he won't shorten it for me, but he won't make it any longer either. Now, um, we have some Angus bulls um, in our dairy catalog and they're minus five days gestation. So here you'll see minus five days. So they will knock days off. So if you take the average beef animal now is roughly 284 days. Um, you have minus five days there. Um, they will knock um, between five to 10 days off the gestation length. Okay. Um, so if you're using short gestation bulls, um, be careful they don't catch you out. And where they'll always catch you out is at the start of the calving season. You'll go out in the morning and you'll find a calf in the slats that you weren't expecting. Okay. So that's just station length. Docility, uh, that's basically temperament, how quiet the cows are. Again, zero is perfect. It leaves you where, where you are. Um, so four star across breed. We know this bull is in the top 40% of temperament. So happy days. That's where we want to be. Carcass weight then. Um, if we're talking about sucklers, we want to be in at least 20 kilos. Okay. We've plenty of Charlies in the book there that are 35 plus. I think some of them go up to plus 42 kilos. But we have to understand as well, we have to um, manage our expectations. We won't get a bull that will give us plus 40 kilos in carcass weight that will be easy calving. So we have to figure out what, how, what traits do I want and how can I prioritize them? Okay. But having said that, if we're in suckling, um, weight pays. Um, we need heavy wheelings, we need cattle to get to slaughter early, and um, carcass weight tells us um, how quickly animals grow. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will end up very, very heavy at the end, but it will tell us that they have a good growth rate, they have a good potential to grow. Okay, So at least look for 20 kilos carcass weight if you're talking about sucklers. Carcass conformation, same story, we need shape. And we especially need shape if we're in the wheeling game, okay, more so than finishing. And you certainly in suckling, you need to be over two. So if you're less than two in suckling, um, and especially if you're selling wheelings, I would start to ask myself questions. And again, use the stars to help you. This bull is five star. That means he's in the top 20%. Okay, so you're getting right up there close to where you want to be. And that's basically your terminal traits then. So if you go back to terminal, these are the bulls we want to produce good wheelings for us and good finished cattle. Now, basically what's inside in the terminal index up here is calving, carcass weight, carcass conformation, and the other thing that's hidden in there is feed efficiency. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out why is that bull low terminal now, if he's good carcass and he's good conformation, it could be feed efficiency. And feed efficiency basically is the efficient animals eat less, and they put on more weight. Um, you could have animals with a super potential to put on weight, but it'll take an awful lot of feet to get there. And we really, really want to avoid that. So that's your terminal index. Now, if we talk about replacement index, we have the overall story up here. The bottom three lines is what will really tell you whether a cow is going to make a good cow for you or not. Okay? And they're... they're um, they're really, really important. So if you're using a bull for replacement, look at the overall index, but definitely look at the bottom three because this is where the detail is. So we've daughter calving difficulty. That really should be called daughter calving ability because it's the ability of the cow to produce ca to, to, to calf. Okay. And the lower that figure, the better because the lower that figure, the less trouble you have. Okay. So just have a flick through the couple of bulls I've put up here now. So we'll start at the bottom guy. This is a proven bull, 5.3%. Um, and the daughter calving difficulty and the direct calving difficulty, you can kind of think about roughly once you're in the same numbers. So for example, um, you know, once we start to go over 8% in any calving figure, we're starting to see trouble. Okay. So 
we're well under eight here, 5.3%. That's a very good figure for daughter calving. That's a proven bull. Two more proven bulls here. Currently in is 4.7. So we're well under eight here where this is where we want to be. Now, flick up to our blue. Now, I know he's a young bull. This is just a predicted figure. But the predicted figure is 8%. So that's telling us that if we keep daughters of this bull, they will have reduced calving ability. Okay? And... That's something we have to look more at, you know, because if you think back to Connor's slides, uh, one of the first thing about calving difficulty is the um, proportion of the cow and the calf, okay? And just um, a, a lack of, um, of a balance between a cow and the bull that was used on her. So if you have cows and they've reduced calving ability because they have an awful lot of shape and you don't want trouble, you have to go with an easier calving bull. It's more sensible to go the other way around and use a, uh, a bull to produce daughters with good calving ability. And then you have a great choice of bulls to put on them and you'll have less trouble. So that's daughter calving ability. The next figure is daughter milk. OK, and again, the stars help us. If we can't remember all these figures, the stars help us. What's this telling us about this bull? He's five star across breed. So he's in the top 20 percent of the population. So if you want milk. We're looking at a good spot here for five star across breed. This particular bull is plus 11 kilos, which is actually huge. And the bottom line is daughter calving interval. And that's uh, a great predictor of fertility. And the calving interval is the distance between calvings. And ideally, if we want to make money in suckling, we need a calf every 365 days. Okay. So, if we use fertile bulls or bulls with high fertility to produce our daughters, that will help us to get a calf every 365 days. Okay, Because fertility, um, it, it is heritable, so we need to start looking at the index. So what's this bull? Is he good or bad? Look at the stars. He's five star across breed. You know, he's top 20%, so that's good. He's minus four days. So you think about calving interval. We're all aiming for 365. If we can take days off, it's better. So if we can get it down to 360, that's fantastic. But what we don't want to do is add days to go up to 370 and 380 and, um, and 390. So you want a minus figure here because you want to reduce the calving interval. Okay, so those three figures and the, 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 the heading tells you expected daughter breeding performance. Quite often, a lot of us just look at the replacement index and we forget to look at the detail down here. OK, so we've daughter calving ability, we've daughter milk and we've daughter calving interval, which tells us about the fertility. Now, sometimes people get confused between gestation length and calving interval. OK, so gestation length is the length of the pregnancy. The calving interval is the distance between calvings. So that's just to sum up of all the little bits of detail that's there in the index and what it actually tells us what to expect from a bull. OK, we're more likely to expect it the higher the reliability. OK, so this is this is a proven bull here. We're over 90% reliability in a lot of the traits. So, you know, we know we'll more likely get what we want if we use that high reliability bull. Same here with Currahin Arp. Very, very um, fully, fully proven bull. So we've reliability all the way down the page. And if you think about it, a bull gets reliability on different traits over a period of time. So... When, 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 when we buy a young bull, we put out a thousand doses the first year to test that bull. Okay, so usually in genotyped animals, most of the traits are about 45, 50% reliability before ever there's a calf hits the ground. Okay, once the calves start to hit the ground, then the first thing we learn about is, is the calving difficulty. The very first thing, the calving difficulty and the gestation length. So we'll get higher reliability on the calving difficulty and the gestation length before the reliability will change on the other traits. The next thing then that happens, if we think about it, our calf is born, so we know, you know whether he was big or small, if he came out okay, we know how long he was in there. 
The next thing we learn then is a bit of a help on the carcass weight. So that's the potential this calf has to grow. And the first indication we have of that is the weaning weight. So once we get the weaning weights in on the progeny of our chest bull, the, the reliability of the carcass weight will go up. The next thing that happens then, when the ICBF scores, we put all our bulls through Gene Ireland because we, we, if we want to find all the information back as quickly as possible and whether it's good or bad, we want to know it. So the ICBF scores then go out and they score the progeny. And that's where we get the carcass confirmation figure. So that's the next thing we get reliability on. He also scores the temperament. So then we get the docility. So we kind of get docility, carcass weight, carcass confirmation. That All that information comes in together. So that's why it's important to keep looking at the updated information. So you could be looking at a catalog that's six months old, where it's in, in such a case, you know, the calves have hit the ground and no information has gone in. Six months later, we might know a hell of a lot more about the calving, the temperament, the carcass weight and carcass conformation. After that, then we have to wait a long time for the next bit of information we have. OK, and the next bit of information we will actually have is on the fertility, which is on the bottom line. OK, because what what tells us that we've good fertility? The first thing is age of puberty. So if if daughters of a bull are are um, are um, take older when they're first inseminated, that will help us figure out, is this an animal that's reaching puberty late or not? The next thing we'll figure out then is the how many inseminations does it take to get them in calf? And it's all about insemination data here because usually the system doesn't know if there's a bull with heifers, okay? But it knows through the system if they've been AI'd because all our AI technicians have hand tens. So we get information on fertility then we have to wait for those daughters to go and calf and calve down before we get the daughter calf in difficulty. And then we have to wait for their calf to be weaned before we get the daughter milk. So it's actually quite a long process. And we don't get all the information at the same time. OK, so if you're talking about a proven bull, we have to talk about what's he proven for. The first thing he'll be proven for is calving, then the terminal traits and then the maternal traits. Okay, so this is a, one of the few examples of a bull you'll find in the catalogue that's fully proven for everything and that has stickers across the board on all the traits. Okay, so um, that's really all the data that's in the catalogue and it's just worth going through in detail because the amount of information that's there is actually phenomenal. Now, I'll move on there now and I'll just very, very quickly flick through the bulls that we have. Okay, one second. Sorry, excuse me, it's not like I get the signal for one minute. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that, I just had to switch between systems. Yeah, you're spot on there now, Rose. Okay, great. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, so before I start talking about bulls, and before any of us start thinking about bulls, um, we have to figure out what we want these bulls to do for us. Okay, and once we do that, the system, it becomes much easier to make decisions. So if we're talking about bulls for maiden heifers, are we talking about bulls to produce replacements? Are we talking about bulls for terminal? Now, obviously, we will have bulls that will be suitable for maiden heifers that will be good replacement bulls as well. And we might have bulls that are suitable for maiden heifers that are good terminal bulls as well. But if we're just looking for maiden heifers, that really has to be our priority first. Are they suitable for maiden heifers? And when you're trying to figure out, is a bull suitable for maiden heifers or not? There's a couple of things that um, we have to think about, first of all. What age are we calving them down at? So are we aiming for two-year-old calving, two and a half, or three-year-old calving? What kind of heifers do we have? Are they well-grown? Um, are they good weight for their age? How much muscling do they have? 
because that will affect the calving ability. Okay, so the maidens is all about what age you want to calve them down at and what type of heifers are they. Then if we're talking about replacements, if we want bulls to produce replacements, we have to think about the cows also we're getting the replacements from. So are we, are we, are we trying to get replacements from extremely milky cows, maybe cows that have too much milk, um, which is nearly as much trouble as no milk? Um, do we want to improve fertility? Do we want to improve docility? What do we really want to improve on the mother? So that's the dam effect. So if you think about the cow we're putting on as well. And then if we're talking about terminal bulls, um, are we producing weanlings? Are we finishing everything? And also have a think about the cow type. Um, because the, the Munster bovine catalogue will only tell you one side of the house. That's about the bulls. You have to try and figure out then um, establish what do you want to improve in your females and what type of females do you have? Okay, so just qu quickly to flick through the slides. We've talked about maiden heifers here, okay? So if you're talking about calving heifers at two years of age and your heifers are quite muscly, which we're seeing an awful lot out there now, you need to go for extreme easy calving bulls. And I'm talking about bulls at four, five, six, less than 7% you need to be at that stage, okay? Now, I've put bulls here of all different breeds and I've their calving difficulty figures here beside them. And the main reason I've done that is the top bull there is an Angus. He's 4.3% calving on beef heifers. Now, if you find an Aubrac that's also 4.3%, you can compare that figure directly or a Salir that's 4.3%. So you can compare all the figures in the catalog, regardless of the breed. And that's important to know. So less than 7% for um, very young heifers and for very, very muscly heifers. After that, if you're getting into well-grown heifers and heifers with good calving ability and good width of pelvis, you can start moving down then to the seven and 8% bulls. And then once you go over, up to eight and a half percent, most guys are still can manage it if they have good quality grown heifers. Once you start to go over that then to the nine percent, you're starting getting into territory that's a bit too difficult. But again, use your own knowledge and your own experience of what happens on your own farm. So, for example, we have plenty of customers using Moon Daragnell there and Maiden heifers at nine percent. And if you're one of those guys or, or, or gals, you can go ahead and continue to use, you know, if you're talking about the same profile of heifers, you'll get away with the same profile of bull. Now, if, for example, last year you used um, Tarlick Moore Magnificent and Albrecht there, for example, he's roughly 6%. And if you trouble, that tells you you need to go easier. If you thought the calves were way too small, then you can go a little bit higher. Um, but the one rule of thumb for maiden heifers is use bulls with very, very high reliability, ideally over 90%, okay? Um, over 90% and then figure out after that, depending on the age and the shape of your heifers, but I would stay under eight and a half percent for safety. Okay, so that's our, that's our maiden heifer offering. These bulls, these four bulls on the side are bulls that you mightn't have used up to now um, that are useful for maiden heifers, okay? They're, they're proven, they're doing a good job. We have experience of them in maiden heifers. Okay, and as you can see, I have four different breeds there. Now replacements, and I have just a full list of bulls here, but it's, and we have lists of bulls in the Munster catalog as well. If you go to the back of the catalog, you will find lists of bulls according to the breed. And in one way, it's a bit difficult to look at, but in another way, it's a great way of really sorting out um, and identifying quickly bulls that might suit you for a specific purpose. So just for example, I've all our replacement bulls ranked here up now, okay? If we just look at our milk figure, the top bull is plus 12 kilos in milk. It's not town Roy. So that's really a lot of milk. If you're using him in extremely milky cows, you might actually end up with too much milk, okay? But you need him if you're short of milk. So this is where you have to think about your cows and think about what you want to improve. In general, 
if you're happy enough with the level of milk in your cows, you know, you're not too much, not too little, everything is hunky-dory, plus four kilos of milk is usually good enough. Four to six kilos is usually good enough, okay? If you have very, very milky cows, you will get away with using bulls at zero and you will get away with a small minus. But what you don't want is a massive minus. Okay, so there's some bulls there in the catalogue that are going to be minus five, minus six, minus seven kilos of milk. They will be really have very little milk relative to their mothers. Okay, also look at the figures of your own cows, especially if you put in the data to ICBF. If you put in weaning weights to ICBF, um, you will have accurate milk figures. If you don't put them in, you won't. So you need to figure out yourself what you have in your own head. Is she a milky cow? Is she not? Okay. So just for replacements, the bulls I put up here, not on rise is Slayer. He's the number one replacement bull in the country. He's fully proven and he has all the things you want for a good cow. Milk, fertility, temperament, calving ability. Okay. The next bull up is an Aubrac. Um, we know a um, little bit less about him. Um, but um, Aubrac's are a breed that if you're not, uh, not familiar with them, they're a real uh, maternal breed. They come from a, they're a mountain breed from France. They're super mothers, great calvers, great milk, great fertility. Okay. And magnificent is all of those things. Curry Hinarp, I talked about already. He's a fully, fully proven bull. And, um, and he's high in all the traits. He's just one of those very, very special bulls that is good for everything. Calving, terminal replacement. Okay. And, and down along. Down to our limousines. Um, Moon Darignell is the number one limousine bull available commercially on replacement index. People are very, very pleased with the daughters. Um, good milk, good fertility. And they're, they're good or great cows, which is what we really want. We don't want extremely muscly bulls to produce our daughters because um, that's not what we want. We want this cow to be able to go and calf, have a calf, rear the calf. OK, so you're talking about a slightly different type bull than you would if you were going for an exceptional weaning. So it's all about horses for courses. I also want to point out Cross Liam here, a limousine that's high in milk. He's plus um, 3.7 kilos in milk. Okay, so if you want a limousine with milk, Cross Liam is your best option. Okay, so look at the data, go down through the lists in the catalog. So if you decide, for example, you want to go with limousine, look at the limousine list, go down along the list and pick what you want to improve in your herd. Um, is it milk? Is it fertility? What is it? And equally, if you want a Simmental or a Slayer or an Aubrac or a Shorthorn or whatever it is, pick your breed, then go down along the traits that you're actually looking for. And I suppose the one thing we've learned since, um, since we have the integrated database in ICBF and we're totally unique in the world in this, we can compare breeds. And the one thing we've learned in Ireland is we have more variation within breeds than we have across breeds. So don't assume if it's a limousine, it'll do this for me. If it's a Charlie, it'll do this for me. Look at the actual data. Okay, we have some Charlies with more milk than we have with some Simmentals, which might be contrary to your view of those breeds. So that's why it's important to look at the actual individual data. So the bulls are recommending for replacements, um, just very quickly. So Moon Darignell is proven. Cross Liam is a plus milk limousine bull, so they're definitely two useful bulls. And O'Mallet is a bull um, that's starting to look very promising, and he's homozygous pole, so you have two capital P's there. In the Simmental, I spoke about Curry Hinarp already, fully proven bull, exceptional bull, and two younger bulls that are coming on now with very high index are, here's Johnny and Listigree Gucci. And remember, Gucci, you can put on maiden heifers. And then for the other breeds, Salaire's Not Town Roy is a fully proven maternal bull as well. Uh, Colvin Dominator is a very good quality short horn. And then Turlick Moore Magnificent and Aubrac. So there's huge choice there for replacements. Um, we all have our own breed preferences. Um, and it's important that we have the sort of cattle that we want. So pick your breed, pick your traits and go from there. Okay, if we're talking about terminal, we're talking about different side of the house now. So what we want is... Um, live calf, super growth afterwards, and good shape. And this is what this panel of bulls is all about. So if we're talking about Charlie, Lapan is fully proven now, um, exceptionally easy calving, 
very good weight, very good shape. I saw a question come up there earlier on. What would you put in fist and cows? He's an ideal bull to put in fist and cows if you wanted to continue with Charlie. Also, remember what I was saying about the double muscle gene. Lapan is not carrying the double muscle gene. So he's a very useful bull to put on very shapey cows. You'll still get enough shape, but you, you, you won't have the risk of having a fully double muscled animal, which would be difficult to come out. Come out. So use all the bits of information that's in the catalog. Orby is a relatively new bull. Calves are hitting the ground. People are absolutely delighted with them. Very small barn, very, very good quality. And Neron then is a bull uh, where we have, we're at the wheeling stage at this stage with him. Um, his heterozygous pulled. I should have my P's after his name. I don't, I apologize for that. Um, Slightly above average calving. So we're into about 6% here on beef cows as opposed to uh, just 5% with Lapan, but super quality, super growth, super shape. And the limousine, Noob is a bull that's really producing fantastic wheelings for us. Um, really extreme in shape, very, very good quality, good growth as well. Tom's Choice Imperial, you may know, is a bull that we've had around for a very long time, doing a very good job. And then Porto is our new star coming up. His homozygous pulled, very good weight gain, very good shape. And then in our blues, um, PPS is, I'd say, our main bull now for producing good quality weanlings. And interestingly, he's carrying the red factor. So if you put him on red cows, um, you've roughly 50% chance of getting a red, red and white calf. Now, if you want to be guaranteed red, you put a red and white bull on your red cows and nothing else can happen. They have to come out either red or red and white. Okay, so if you're um, if you're following the rones of the Twitter and all this um, uh, fashion, um, if you want guarantee, you go for a red and white bull. Um, PPS, you have fifty percent chance of getting a red, but very very good quality. And Delure then is a proven bull we've been using in Suckler for wheeling production for a number of years now, and he's that super balance between calving and quality. Other breeds, just to um, quickly touch on other breeds, um, if we're talking about Angus, um, HW Fargal is, is breeding exceptionally well, um, both in pedigree and commercial uh, terms. And he's also being used for um, commercial heifers. Um, very good quality bull, good weight, good shape. Lord Horacio is relatively new, very similar bull to Friarstown Ideal Pete. So if, you, um, if you're used to using that bloodline, he's almost a carbon copy. And then Powys, with Angus here carrying the double muscle gene. So if you're finishing Angus and you want a lot of weight and you want to up your carcass conformation, this is a bull that'll do it for you, okay? So he's a bull um, that's plus 20 kilos in carcass weight with a lot of extra shape. So it's all about horses for courses. I wouldn't put him in maiden heifers. Okay, but I put him on cows to get my weight in shape. Um, we've also very, very good um, um, selection of Herefords. So have a look in the catalogue. I just put up a sample here. Fisher One Profile, um, I would argue, is one of the best Herefords you'll find anywhere now in the world um, because he's just that magic combination of calving ease, shot gestation and quality. So whether you're a pedigree breeder or a suckler farmer, He's a bull that will do a great job for you. Soul Paul Spark um, is a young bull we have in the stud. We're waiting for the calves to come. And Alladale Rory is a proven horned Hereford. Very good quality bull, good in calving, good weight, good shape. Now quickly, what's new? Parfum Proper is a new limousine bull. He's an Aravel son. Um, very good on gestation. He was born early, so we need to wait to see what he'll do. Um, but a low risk bull to test really because he's a super quality bull, he's very good index and he's predicted at 6.6% um, on beef heifers. So very safe bull to test on cows. I would never recommend using a test bull on heifers, okay? But very safe bull to test on cows. Cluna Don Ricky is a new fist and son. Um, a bull I personally have high hopes for. Exceptional bull himself. Um, very good on weight very good in shape, very functional, very classy, um, and a super pedigree, a feast and son of the Cave Lens Fenian. He's also carrying one copy of the double muscle gene. So that tells you you'll get more shape. Okay, so if you're playing cows, super bull, um, if you want to um, uh, try out a little bit of him. 
Now, he's a brand new uh, blue. I talked about him earlier on. He's very interesting in that he's heterozygous polled. Um, he's the first blue poll bull uh, to stand in AI in Ireland. Now, his index might look too exciting to you, okay? But have a look at the reliability. The reliability is, is low. So what's ICBF saying to us here? That what they're saying is, we don't know a lot about this blood bull. We don't know a lot about this bloodline, okay? But we in Munster know more about this bull, okay? Because we have the data from the UK. This bull came from the UK. We have the data from Belgium. He's um, all the top side of his pedigree is Belgian. So that's why you read the comments in the catalog. So the comments tell you the sire is an easy calf in Belgian sire. Um, so even though the index can't tell you a lot, that's why you look at the stickers and look at the comments because and then you bring all the information together. Newton is the same story, low reliability, very, very good quality bull, proven genetics in Belgium. New Simmental, Lee Hard Lynx, um, very good index very low calving difficulty in beef heifers and beef cows. Okay, so bull, um, bull well worth using and well worth trying. New Angus, Tara Terminus, um, really, really classy bull, and a bull that I expect to fit into a lot of markets, um, both in suckling, in pedigree, and hopefully suitable for dairy cows as well. Here's a red Angus, um, and there's a little bit of interest at the moment in red Angus to use them on suckler heifers, um, especially if you're using limousine and you still want to keep the color and you just want to go that little bit easier calving. Um, so he's a really, really nice quality bull. Again, the reliability is low. ICBF doesn't know an awful lot about this bloodline, but as part of our breeding program, we bought in this bloodline um, because it's the bloodline is doing very well in the UK. And I leave it at that, Dennis. Um, thank you very much. And I'll uh, I'll take questions. Great stuff, Rose. Um, so I know we're, we're probably running over a little bit in time, but we have a load of questions in. So um, I think we'll we'll crack on and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. So because um, everyone is staying on, there's a big crowd on, and everyone is staying on. So which is a great sign. So and there's about half and half. Questions, so we'll we'll crack on. And we'll try and be as brief sure, as possible with the answers if we can. Um, so, is that you, Soros? Top Charlie Bull for, for pedigrees, for a pedigree breeder. Great, you have a huge, you have a huge choice there. So for our pedigree breeders, we do we do two things. So you can use um, the main monster catalogue, which and all of the bulls available um, with the technicians in the tanks are in the front of the catalogue. In the back of the catalogue, you'll call what we find our prestige range, okay? So if you're talking about a top Charlie bull for pedigrees, what are you looking for? Do you want a bull for maidens? If 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 uh, if you are, then a bull like uh, VMO is a bull that will do a fantastic job for you. It's a French bull, fully proven on, uh, on maiden heifers, and you'll get great, great cows from it, okay? If you want a bull with, um, with more shape, more growth, and still keep easy calving, that pawn is a fantastic all-round bull. Very, very useful bull. And then if you're talking about a bull that will give you um, more shape, I would definitely use that new Fist and Son because I think he's a bull that will really, really do a good job. He's an exceptional specimen of the breed himself. He's carrying the double muscle gene and uh, he's also super in his legs and feet. So it's all about horses for courses. Um, so just because it's pedigree breeding, um, we still have to figure out what do we want to improve. But there are three bulls anyway I'd highly recommend. Very good, very good. So you still have to establish your goals. Connor, a couple of questions in about pneumonia, vaccination and calves. So timing and any preference for intranasal versus um, injectable. Okay, so I suppose um, for autumn-born calves that are going into the shed, um, typically are the ones that maybe suffer the most from pneumonia because they're being housed with adult cattle. Um, it depends when you're doing them. So if you want to use the two-shot program um, uh, that doesn't go intranasally, then you have to start a little bit before um, before they're housed. Do you know what I mean? So uh, they'll, they'll have protection two weeks after the second shot. Very same as a COVID vaccine. Um, so you know, you're talking about starting six weeks in advance of when you when you expect to see trouble. If you're having trouble in a shed and this calves being born, you can use some of the intranasal vaccines five, six days, up to nine days after birth. 
and you'll have protection maybe 10 to 14 days after. So, um, you know, it's fast directed. It doesn't last as long, but it's fast directed. So it depends on what the situation is in the shed and when you can start the program versus when the risk is. Very good, very good. Um, so back to you, Rose. Uh, someone here with, with limousine, limousine cross codes. Um, I think you're going limousine Belgium blue to breed replacements. Any, any, uh, any thoughts there? Yeah, again, look, it depends on what you want yourself. It depends on what sort of cattle you want to breed, and it depends on um, on um, also your circumstances from the point of view are you going to be there calving or not. Okay, so is the question, are we going from limousine to limousine cross blue females? Uh, I think he's limousine cross limousine cows, and he's, he's uh, wondering about going limousine cross blue to, to breed replacements. That's his okay. question. Yeah. Okay, so if so, he's limousine cross blue, what he will get is an awful lot of extra shape, so he will have much better quality animals from wheeling and finishing point of view. Big question is, is it going to be worth it? Okay. Because what you what you can expect with a lot more shape in females is um, more calving difficulty. You definitely lose more calves. You possibly might lose cows. Um, calves that have a pull on the way out are more likely to die. Um, so the question is: Is it going to be worth it if you're if if um, if you're if you want to show commercial stock? It's a good idea because you need that quality. OK, but you have to make sure that somebody is at home watching those cows calving. OK, it's not an option to go to work and leave those cows um, at home to do the job in themselves. Um, I'd only consider that if I was into commercial showing, to be honest. For no okay. suckling, you'll gain on one side and you lose at the other side. You lose more calves, you take your cows longer to go back and calf. So you might have the old um, ego buzz of having something super in the mart but you might have less wheelings to go to the mark with. So yeah, yeah. your bottom line um, mightn't be the better for it. And balance. So, yeah, read, read between the lines there. Uh, Connor, calf jackets, what are your thoughts on them? Someone is looking to know. Yeah, so calf jackets can be very useful. Um, I, I saw the question there about temperature regulation. So a calf, a calf won't regulate its own temperature or generate heat, for example, until it starts ruminating or chewing the cud, generally over 30 days. Um, so basically, a calf is warmed by the milk that it has in it. Now, in sulfur calves, generally, that's not an issue because they have free access to milk. It's more of an issue in, in, in artificially rare calves that are, you know, that have a limited supply of milk. But um, if you have sheds that are open, if you have drafts, you know, if you have um, any sort of issue like that, then jackets will bring that extra benefit, I suppose, the only caveat is you have to take them off and um, you have to take them off on a day that's suitable to take them off and not freeze them once they come off, you know. Very useful for sick calves as well. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, very good question here now, Rose. Why no star rating for feed efficiency? You mentioned feed efficiency there as part of the, as part of the index. But, uh, it's a very good point. Um, there actually is a star um, rating for feed efficiency, but it's not displayed on the catalogue page. Okay, and it's 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 something we've discussed with ICBF, and ICBF tells us if we put everything on the page, then you know what I mean. That we won't be able to, um, it won't fit on the page. If you're interested in feed efficiency, you can uh, you can find it there. Go into the ICBF website, click on terminal index, click on the actual word terminal. You can get details on everything that makes up the terminal index, including feed efficiency, and you can find the data there. And you will find the stars there. So it's it's actually there, but it's not displayed in the catalogues and it's not displayed on the first screen you'll find when you go in and the ICBF bull search. Okay, so it's there, but it was a bit deeper. It, it's a good point. I think we should consider putting it in the catalogue, especially from the point of view of climate change, because mm. what we want now with the pressure on with climate change, we want more efficient animals, we want them to finish quicker, and we want them to be more efficient. And that will improve our bottom line because the less feed we put in to get the same result, the better. And it will also improve with our climate change argument because we will be able to finish feed efficient animals will finish quicker, more efficiently. Quicker on less feed really is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. Uh, back to you again, Room and Fluke. And I suppose 
there was a good bit of chat really around the, the beep and when the when the sampling was done, you know, it was it was quite early. And if you got a negative result for liver fluke and positive for rumen fluke and all the way and all the rest. So your thoughts there? Yeah, I suppose um <clears throat> well obviously the scheme was designed to be paid for Christmas. Um, so you had to have the samples taken uh, two months ahead of the payment date or else uh, you wouldn't get paid by Christmas. Um, but unfortunately, um, that's the reality of it, I suppose. Um, unfortunately, as I pointed out, this year's fluke harvest, you won't see eggs to that until um, after Christmas. Mm-hmm. So if you had a positive liver fluke sample in July or August, whenever you took the sample, that's last year's fluke. Basically, what it means is your winter dosing program last year wasn't up to scratch uh, now, I know most of you would probably have a negative for liver fluke, which means your winter dosing program last year did the job 100%. And um, that's all that means. Roman fluke positive then. So if you if we open Romans um, in the factory or in post-mortem or whatever, you'll see a lot of Roman fluke. And adult Roman fluke don't cause any harm to the animal. Um, the larvae of Roman fluke um, will cause quite a bit of damage in the small intestine for animals that uh, pick it up for the first time, and typically wingmans. So you will always see scour with those. You'll always see, sometimes you see blood in the scour can be mistaken for coccidiosis. Um, and in cows that maybe pick it up for the first time, you will see them quite, doing quite poorly, but they always have scour. So under no circumstances would I ever bother treating an animal for Roman flu that didn't have a scour, regardless of what the sample said. Um, and I think what's happening is pr- probably is an awful lot of effort and uh, arm work being used, dosing cows for Roman flu that don't need to be dosed and then um, maybe ignoring some of the more important things like liver flu or, um, you know, um, lice and mange. So um, as a general rule, if the animal is not scouring or looks like it's badly done, it doesn't need a dose for Roman flu. So what we'd, we'd advise our farmers here, for example, is treat your liver flu and your worms and if you have an individual animal scoured and after that, then, you know, pick out the few individuals and dose them. Yeah, very good. And, uh, I suppose the dogs yeah. can be a bit, a, bit, a bit misleading because they often come back positive for... Mm. Mm. Um, Rose, is it possible that uh, plus, 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 plus will are an F90L, 94L carrier? It is, it is. Um, the the mystatin can be confusing because what we have with the mystatin is... Um, we have 11 variants. Mm-hmm. Variants then are divided into what they call disruptive variants and non-disruptive variants. So when we're talking about carriers of myostatin, we're only talking about the disruptive variants. And the ones there that are quite common that, you know, we'd be familiar with is the NTA21, which you find in all blues, you find a bit in limousine, you find a bit in blonde and parthenase and so on. The other one is the Charlie one, the Q204X. They're the two most common ones we come across. Okay, so they're disruptive variants because we get a bit of higher cal- higher birth weights and we also get reduced calving ability on the females. So if an animal is carrying any of those, they're called myostatin carriers. The F94L is also myostatin variant, but it's non-disruptive. So uh, even though the animal has it, they're not considered true carriers. So they're plus plus, and then that's why we put the extra bit of information on the side. So for example, powerful proper there is 2F94L. Um, so um, so we, we usually put the 94L beside the plus plus just to explain, you know what I mean, that it's there, but they're not true carriers. Okay, very good, very good. Um, and I'll stick with you. Someone here looking for a Charlie to breed replacements. Obviously, fond of the Charlie breed and looking to breed Charlie cows, commercial Charlie cows. Charlie to breed replacements. Um, again, very hard to go past Lapan um, because he's a proven bull. I like him for replacements because he's not carrying the double muscle gene. Okay, so that we, we get all our weight gain and we don't have the, the trouble with the calving ability. Um, good milk, good fertility, very functional cows, very good legs and feet, and good temperament. So he would be my absolute top choice for uh, for replacements. Very good. Um, Connor, I might ask this one to you. Calving at 24 months, there's a lot of research behind us, but yet some, I suppose some breeders there, they still want to breed their, their maidens a bit older. 
is there merit to it or should it be possible to, to breed them all really at 24 months? Well, <clears throat> it depends what happened in the first 24 months, I suppose, or in the first 15 anyway. Um, if you have well-grown heifers, uh, you know, hitting puberty, 400 to 424, 40 kilos, depending on the breed of them, um, at, at, at 15 months, then you can go ahead and breed them, You're picking a suitable bull. Now, I suppose uh, the advantage to that as a farmer is you, you don't have a bunch of idle stock going on for another year um, before they produce something. But um, where we see a lot of farmers finding difficulty is is getting them back in calf. They actually don't. If they pick the bulls right, they don't have much bother calving them. It's getting them back in calf the second year is the issue. And key to that, in my experience, is, uh, and I keep them myself and, and breed them and calve them to myself, is having them in a pen on their own um, for that first winter. So if they're in mixed in with cows, they just get bullied around the place and they lose too much condition and they don't go back in calf and you end up losing two or three months on them and it's a disaster. Now, then the other thing is, I suppose, if you're buying in maidens to breed them, if you're not breeding your own replacements, it's really no difference because you're generally going to buy them and bull them within a month to buy them or two months. So it doesn't matter whether they're 15 months or 18 months. Um, the one thing I will say is that a heifer at, at 420 kilos at 15 months is a better, genetically better animal than one that's 420 at 22 months or 24 months. Um, that you're going to put in a calf at that stage. So there's a lot of factors, but if you are bra- if you are calving them a two year old, they need you need to have a pen on their own for the heifers and not to mix them with cows. That's my view on it anyway. Very good. And of course, the, 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 what Rose was talking about is the choice of bull you put on them to make sure they do they do have an easy calving. Uh, someone here, a sharp person, Connor, they noticed you were talking about uh, mange and didn't mention any treatments. So, so they were wondering, would you offer a yeah. mange? So I suppose um, mange generally, um, obviously a light spot on our treatment isn't going to cure mange. Um, so we're generally talking about um, uh, doramectin or cydectin or ivermectin, maybe two shots of ivermectin. Um, and the, the particular, so oftentimes you see that around the tail head, you see a little bit uh, skin throughout the tail head. Um, so certainly something like dectamax or cydectin there might be useful there. The particular picture I put up there was um, Seropsis which is very rare. Um, it's a case we had about four years ago, and that required two shots of Dectamax um, a fortnight apart. So it, look at it, if, if, if you are, people will be giving out, I see them giving out on, on, on social media the whole time about lice and mange and all the rest of it. But um, the key thing is, if, if you appear to have a product failure, maybe ask, um, you're about to have a look because it might be mange or in isolated cases could be that very bad mange. Yeah. Okay. Injectables you're talking about there as opposed to... Usually injectables, yeah. yeah. Get a better yeah. response, yeah. Um, good question here, Rose. How is the milk figure uh, calculated and how reliable is it? So if you're looking at the milk figure of any, um, of any bull, a um, couple of things to be aware of have a look at the reliability beside it as well. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out how accurate is it, if it's over 90% reliable, it's extremely accurate. So I presented some bulls there this evening, like Curry up, for example. Um, he's plus 4.8 kilos of milk, 99% reliable. That's extremely reliable. Okay. I also put up some uh, a test bull, uh, par for proper. Um, his milk figure reliability off the top of my head is probably about 45% because we're on, it's only genomic figure. That's not accurate. We just have to wait and see what he'll do. Okay, so if you if you really want milk, you're better off using the bulls that are proven um, where, the, where we actually have the data. Okay? Now, that's not to say you don't totally discount the genomic figure. Do you know what I mean? It is, it is useful information, but it's just not as useful as the fully proven figure. Okay, so... Um, Look at the milk figure, look at the reliability beside it. Now, how is it calculated? It's calculated based on weaning weight. So um, when we put our bulls through Gin Island, um, we follow the daughters through, and when they calve down, we follow when their weanlings are due to come um, to weaning stage, and all the weanlings in that herd are weighed. 
So then we have a comparison between our test bulls and our proven bulls and the bulls that are kind of in between. So it's, um, it's measured on weaning weight. Now, the problem is we don't have enough weaning weights in Ireland. Um, so, um, you know what I mean? So if, if, and if somebody wants accurate milk figures on their own cows, the best thing to do is weigh the calves at weaning, weigh the batch. You know what I mean? If you, if you wean a batch of calves, weigh them at weaning. And especially if you're not feeding creep, um, you really sort out the cows with milk and the cows don't have milk. If you're feeding creep, it's harder to sort them out. Um, so all, all information coming from the beef rolls should should improve the accuracy. So the milk figure should it? It should. It should. It should. If the weighing is done accurately, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, someone here, three month old calves coughing, wondering what's the course of action, lungworm or virus, or what should he um what should he do, I suppose? Okay, well, three months old, um, I suppose if they're only gone into the shed, they could have been eating grass outside, so it's possible that it's lungworm. Um, it's also possible that it's a virus, but, um, you know, I suppose the, the the signs of lungworm is a persistent cough that, you know, sort of a hoozy cough, as they say, um, virus to tend to stream from the eyes and maybe have bits of snots, but... If he, if he or she isn't sure, she'll get someone to look at it and maybe take a swab and see is it a virus. Either either way, they probably want treatment. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Um, Charlie Cows, Jen Rose, um, using a cemental bull to, to breed replacements after Charlie Cows. Uh, hot bull, I suppose, or, or is it a good idea? Full stop. Well, look, again, it, uh, um, it depends people want do you know what I mean um different people have different ideas as to what their favorite breed is do you know what I mean so it's important if you're sucklers and you enjoy your suckling that you breed the type of cattle that you want so that's the first thing to say okay um Simitals is a useful bull and Charlie from the point of view of um we do tend to get extra milk and Simitals like most of our Simitals there are um from about plus four and a half kilos um, up to plus 12 or plus 14 kilos. Okay, so you do have a big choice in Simmentals from the point of view of milk. Um, you won't tend to get the same level of milk in the Charlie. The only concern I would have with a Simmental cross, a Charlie cow, is you might get into the stage where your mature cow, your mature cow weight might start to get a bit too heavy. Okay? Yeah. So that's why it's, it's a good idea as well to read the comments in the catalogue. So, for example, we have a bull there in the catalogue, um, Listigree Gucci. And he is a moderate-sized bull, early maturing. Um, so he's a bull that I would really think would work well on Charlie Cows. Um, you'll get your milk, you'll get your extra milk, but you'll get, um, you won't get, um, you'll have a cow size as well, because you don't want to get, you know, we don't want cows around the place 900 kilos and a ton weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah they don't tend to leave enough money at the end of the day. So the only concern I have with that cross would be the, the mature cow weight. Very good. Well, I think we have a, a two-hour limit on this platform, so I might I might ask one more question here. Um, a G a G gene carrier bull, a bad job on fist and cows for pedigree Charlie breeding. I take it is referring to the progressive ataxia and Charlie, that's the question. Okay, is it? I don't know what the G. What do you mean by the G gene? So we'll talk about progressive ataxy first, and we just cover my stacking yeah. as well. This is my stacking you're talking about. Okay, so with progressive ataxy, it's a genetic defect that's in the Charlie breed, um, and we have outlined in the catalogue there all the carriers and all the non-carriers. So if you're worried about progressive ataxy as a Charlie breeder, and um, there's two things I would do: I would test all my cows first of all, because then you'll know exactly where you are. And the second thing then is I would try and make up my mind, am I going to work with bulls that are carriers of this gene or do I want to eliminate it entirely? If your cows are free and you do not want to, you want to not have it in your herd, then use all um, taxi free bulls. So that's that's a very clean situation. Very good. good. Non-carrier cows use non-carrier bulls. If you're talking about using carrier bulls, I wouldn't have an issue with it. 
but you need to know the status of your cows. So if your cow is a non-carrier and you really like a bull and you want to use him and he is a carrier, um, go ahead and use him. But I wouldn't go using carrier bulls and cows that I wouldn't know the status of. Because it's just half the story. Now, if the G gene refers to myostatin, it's the, it's, it's, it's the same story, really. If you, um, if you know the status of your cow, it's much easier to do the, the mating then. Yeah. Very good. So we're, we're heading for 10 o'clock. So we have a fair old session. So we'll, we'll, we'll probably leave it go there. So um, I want to really thank the two speakers, uh, two brilliant presentations and fantastic answers to all the questions as well. So thank you very much, Rose. And thank you very much, Connor. And thanks to, the, the, to Denise and Rachel on my side as well, who organised all this and um, uh, are responsible for, for all the organisation behind the scenes. So, so on that note, I'll say goodnight to everyone and, uh, and thanks for watching.